Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. With a spot of levity today, as we are going to talk about one of the darkest secrets of the Grey Knights chapter. Now, Arch, you might say, that doesn't sound very cheery, but, well, I disagree. As I think that the tale I'm going to spin you today is one of the most unintentionally funny stories in 40k in general, perhaps even rivaling some of the stories of the hero of the Imperium, Cyphus Kane himself. And it all starts with a demon blade of unimaginable power. And when I say that, I mean it literally. Even the Grey Knights themselves, considered to be rather erudite on the matters of chaos and its multitude of weaponry, have been unable to quantify its potential, unable to measure it, unable to scale or contain it, despite having studied it now for over a thousand years. Frankly, the damn thing's become quite the headache. And yet they can't simply get rid of it either, as the last time someone so much as touched it, it raised three entire sectors. For you see, the weapon, the Blade of Antwir, has the ability to instantaneously possess anyone who touches it, turning them into willing puppets of its every wish and whim. This power extends to anyone nearby as well, allowing it to form entire armies in the actual blink of an eye. And rather than merely forming armies of blind, unorganized cultists, the weapon possesses a keen intellect and astounding knowledge which it really should not possess. It even has the secrets to manufacture lost pieces of technology that the Imperium has long since forgotten all about. It took ten years, and the deaths of billions, and the near destruction of an entire Space Marine chapter to defeat it the first time around, and even then only with the intervention of eight brotherhoods of the Grey Knights, the full combined strength of the entirety of the Grey Knights chapter. And just to put that into a bit of perspective, Angron the Demon Primarch only warranted the deployment of one brotherhood. And yet, worse still than the Blade's apocalyptic destructive force is the fact that once it was finally defeated and cornered, it simply disappeared wrenched back into the warp through some unknown means. Unsurprisingly, the Grey Knights took this rather personally and dedicated a great deal of their chapter's assets and precognitive abilities to figure out where the blade would re-emerge next. And in the 40th millennium, their efforts paid off as they managed to scry where exactly Antwir would re-emerge. And it turns out that Antwir had taken their previous interactions somewhat to heart as well, as it was targeting the moon of Thetis. Thetis, in case you've forgotten from the Grey Knight's lore video, is one of the Grey Knight's most closely guarded secrets. A world quite literally covered in chaos and in demonic energies. A planet where the servants of the arch enemy stalk relentlessly and unendingly because it is also the site of the hidden archive of the Librarium Demonicum under the purview of the Inquisition and the Grey Knights, who use the planet as a testing ground for paladins. As you may remember from the Paladins video, one of the tests that a Grey Knight must succeed in to become a paladin is to survive on the surface of Tethys, surrounded on all sides by corruption and demons, and without his armor. 
Harvey requires a genius to see what Antwerp's plans were here. Clearly, it intended to strike at the Librarium, destroying it, and in the process, hiding some perhaps vital piece of information about itself or demon kind in general. But forewarned of the Blade's appearance, the Grey Knights were ready, and this time they managed to capture it. At least for the time being, because getting a hold of the sword turned out to be the easy part, as even after having discussed, investigated, and attempted to destroy the blade countless times over the course of weeks, the Grey Knights came to the conclusion that they couldn't destroy it. They couldn't even contain it. Even the deepest vaults on Titan, guarded constantly by Grey Knights librarians and shrouded and hidden behind wards of the most hideous potency, it was expected the vaults could do nothing more than delay its escape. Finally, the Grey Knights arrived at a dark and none too honourable solution. The blade would be placed in the hands of the Brotherhood Champions of the Purifiers. The most faithful, the most ardent, and the purest, most uncorruptible of all Grey Knights. Their champion being the scion of everything it was to be a purifier. A creature that is natural anathema to the powers of chaos. And even then, it was merely a question of time as the blade corrupted champion after champion after champion, with no end in sight. The last bearer of the weapon, before the current one, that is, was Brotherhood champion and Castellan Meret Gavalan. At the head of the Purifier's Brotherhood, he had been dispatched to the world of Sundava II, a planet that had recently fallen under the sway of Sleneshi demon hordes, after one of their numbers, a greater demon, had corrupted the planet's chief cardinal of the Imperial Faith, and began a heretical uprising. Over the course of the Grey Knight's Purifier's cleansing war on the face of that world, aided by much of the planet's PDF who had not fallen under the sway of the Cardinal, Antwir worked his magic on Gavalan, until eventually managing to subsume the proud Grey Knight's mind to the point where he was no longer able to resist the Blade's suggestions. Expertly manipulating him, he saw the Grey Knight's purifier seek out an audience with the world's planetary governor, Otto Glass. And the moment that the Governor, the Purifier, and the Blade were in the same room, it took control, paralyzing Gavilan and rendering him unable to act or speak. It instantly possessed Otto, forcing the Lord Governor to touch it, making him into nothing more than a fresh meat puppet for the Blade's wills sadistically opening the throat of its previous captor, the blade rejoiced. Antwir had found an escape, finally, at long last, freedom. And it would have been so as well, were it not for the actions of another Grey Knight purifier, Garen Crown. He managed to not only rally his brethren and defeat the heretic uprising, but he also slew Otto and reclaimed the weapon. Oh well, a minor setback, another purifier that must be corrupted, perhaps even a few generations of purifiers until another opportunity presented itself. And the creature within the steel, Antwir, is nothing if not patient. And yet, 
there was something awry with this new bearer of his. Antwer had been around for a long time, his origins unknown even to the Grey Knights who had been studying him. There were those amongst their numbers who believed that the blade might be so old that its origins simply could not be traced at all. There were even those who theorized that Antwer was not a demon at all, merely possessing a blade, a hunk of metal, but rather that the creature inside was something far, far older and colder. A shard, perhaps, of an entity that once rivaled the Great Fall. But now here it sat, Antwer, the Ancient One, the Unknowable One, the Unrivaled, in the hands of a new warrior, a brutish new warrior. And Antwer realized with some shock, I imagine, that he was having no effect on Crow. Now, this in and of itself was not necessarily unusual. He had been born now by several champions of the Grey Knights, and they had impeccable mental defenses. But there was always something, a dent, a scratch, a divot, something for Antwer to claw at, to dig at, to tear at, and to slowly but surely widen. Scratch, 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 scratch. Oh, it might take months, it might take years, it might take decades, but there was always something. Yet Crow's mind was <laughs> smooth. A perfect, flawless sphere, shining bright to Antwerp's senses. Not a scuff. Not a bruise, not the most minute or microscopic of imperfections or flaws. A complete absence of anything to dig at. This must have no doubt puzzled the blade, as it had seen countless champions come before Crow, and he'd found a weakness in each and every one of them. But it mattered not. If a soft spot did not exist, then it was merely a simple task of creating one. And Antwer, again, with infinite patience, set to work, hacking, bludgeoning, blasting, and picking away at Crow's mental defenses. This was labor that Antwer knew well and had grown quite good at, having sent dozens of champions to an early grave already. Mental drills, psychic bludgeons, rams of sheer psionic energy hammered into the Grey Knight's defenses, day in and day out, night in and night out. Not granting the Grey Knight even a moment of respite, the demon continued to batter itself bloody against it for a year, and then another, and then a third, a fourth, and a fifth year passed as well, and a sixth began to dawn, as Antwer started to realize that this was getting him absolutely nowhere. Every assault, every maneuver, every battering blast was turned aside by the kind of callous indifference that spoke of the most minute of efforts on behalf of his new bearer. Ah, well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. If brute force would not prevail, then subterfuge would win the day. And so the blade began to speak to Crow. He was the mightiest warrior of the God Emperor. None had ever resisted the blade's effort so stubbornly. He had proven himself to be a worthy master. If only he would allow Antwer to help him out a little bit, then Crow could have might unmatched. He could become the shining champion of humanity. No demon could stand before him ever again. Silence. Nothing. Not even a hint. Okay. Might was not enticing enough. Power 
than authority. If he would but listen to Antwerp's advice, he was ancient after all, he could guarantee that Crow would rise to the top of the Grey Knight's chapter. Imagine the good he could do from such an exalted position. Imagine the purity he could bring to that leadership. Again, like speaking to a granite wall. All right, might and authority doesn't seem to be particularly persuasive. What about something more unusual for a man in his position? Earthly desires, riches? No? Uh, women? Freedom? Anything? Like pissing into a hurricane, this, frankly. As no matter what promise, no matter what enticement, no matter what ploy the blade tried, it was all met with the same absolute stony silence, as if he wasn't even speaking at all. I fondly imagine the sword trying countless things here, promising him everything from the greatest ambitions to the tiniest releases. And every day, Crow just stares at the sword. Nothing more, just, just stares at it. Occasionally breathing or swallowing, perhaps. Realizing that he was getting absolutely nowhere with this, Antwer was beginning to get a little bit desperate. Assaulting the Grey Knight's mental fortress had proven about as fruitful as attempting to fornicate with a lava flow. As for promises and temptations, even a demonic sword can only handle so much awkward silence. No, if Antwer was ever going to be free again, it wasn't going to be through corrupting Krau, at least well, not in the short term. Well, there are other possibilities here. The blade had a way of disappearing, after all. It knew for a fact it could work its way out from underneath even the densest wards at the bottom of a titan. And Crow kept the sword in a scabbard, in his private inner reliquary. Even there, the mental presence of the countless grey knights must have been oppressive in the extreme for an entity like Antwer, but if he could just get himself free, even for but a moment, he might be able to escape or at least lead the Grey Knights on a merry chase around their fortress monastery to find him yet again. And so he began squirming, writhing, wreathing in just the tiniest fractal forms, creating microscopic moments of friction, which allowed the blade to slide slowly, oh so torturously slowly, millimeters a week out of its scabbard. But no sooner had the blade felt the first minute rays of artificial light before Crow discovered exactly what the blade was doing. He'd been measuring it every single day with religious perfection and pushed it right back into its scabbard again. Well, Antwerp had hardly expected to succeed on the first try, and so he started again, but even slower and more careful this time, making sure that Crow was nowhere nearby to observe the blade's movement. The result was the same. In the face of Crow's endless, obsessive autism, all the powers of the warp availed Antwerp not. He tried again, and again, and again, and the only result was that Crow would bind the blade ever tighter every time. Well, shit. Okay, a measure of last resort then. Antwer was hesitant to commit to this course of action as it might endanger him and would absolutely endanger his kith and kin, even if unintentional. For you see, there is one thing that every Grey Knight always seeks, even Antwerp's stubborn guardian. Knowledge. Dark knowledge. And so the weapon made new promises. It would tell Crow the true names of demons to be inscribed within the Grey Knight's ever-increasing librarius. It would tell them their locations, their plans, 
It might even tell them how to vanquish them once and for all. All he would need is minor concessions, a loosening on the reins that bound him into his scabbard, perhaps even a moment of freedom. If Crow would just promise to draw upon the sword's powers just once, then all this knowledge and more would be his. Crow finally responded, for the first time in years of absolute silence. He nodded, left the room, and came back with an enormous blank tome, upon which he rested a quill and simply resumed staring at the sword. Once again, I fondly imagine the scene. In a dank little private room, you've got Crow on one end of the room just sitting there, motionless, like a statue, occasionally blinking every five minutes. You might be able to see his, his chest moving as he breathes, maybe. On the opposite end of the room, the sword, leant against the wall. As the silence stretches for hours and days, as the superhuman metabolism of the Grey Knight allows him to just be there, just sit there, staring, breathing. Until eventually, the blade was the first to crack. Having been reduced to this, Antwer now simply started hurling insults and threats at the Grey Knights. Anything and everything. It would skin him alive, carve his eyeballs out of his skull one wafer-thin slice at a time, boil him for an eternity in Korn's bubbling blood pits, rip the teeth from his gums and hammer them through his skull with a device fashioned from his brother's bones. He would... Grey Knight was writing now. Crow was writing down every threat, every curse, every insult. And the moment the blade stopped, it would stop and simply resume staring silently at the sword. And we tried subterfuge again. He would undoubtedly have fed Crow lies. Countless false prophecies, tales of demon uprisings on half-known worlds on the other end of the galaxy, of demonic cults on terror itself, of plots to kill the god emperor, of assassinations proceedings against the grand master of the Grey Knights. Ever grander did the sword lies grow, and Crow simply continued writing, handing over volume after volume after volume to the members of the Orders. They poured over the lies, analyzed them, and rejected them. Occasionally, Antwer would have fed in a hint of truth here and there, to try to convince Crow that if only he would lower his guard for a moment, he'd give him the full truth. He's trying. He just needs Crow's help. If only he could connect to his mind, he could explain things so more clearly. More scratching sounds as the quill continues and then suddenly stops, and silence descends yet again. The lies would slowly grow more and more ridiculous. A brother Petunia of the Third Brotherhood is actually a she, and hides countless little pink ribbons in the bottom drawer of his armory chamber. And worse still, even the most ridiculous lie, the most blatant falsehood, or even the truth itself on occasion, was always met by the exact same reaction. Scribble, 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 stop. Silence. After another decade odd of this, Antwer was really starting to run out of any and all hope, and was getting desperate, becoming more and more active, more and more over the top in its attempts to escape. It was no longer attempting to sneak its way out of its scabbards, it was shaking violently against every restraint, tearing at its covering, tearing at the scabbard, attempting to chew its way out to escape, presumably screaming piteously half-mad all the while whilst doing so. And it began screaming at Crow yet again, threatening him. I will escape. I will tear my way out. You cannot stop me. You cannot be with me every moment. I will find an opening. The moment I slip out, I will be gone. 
And yet again, I fondly imagine that this was the course of events that caused Crow to speak to the blade for the first and the last time, to utter five simple words. Thank you for the warning. And then he gripped a hold of the blade and never, ever let go ever again. Crow would hold the blade in his hand as he slept, as he ate, as he went to the privy, as he trained, as he studied, as he spoke to his men. Antwer never again left Crow's grip. Not even in battle. Once more, I imagine the screaming was probably the loudest and most annoying part there for quite a while. But finally, there was an opportunity here. Crow could now not let go of the blade. If he did for even a moment, it would be free. It might be able to corrupt those around him in battle. It might even be able to slay Crow. It was a demon blade after all. It saw an opportunity. If it could only see its wielder dead, it would finally be free. It could be gone. It attempted, it tried to move, a lethal blow away just an inch, allowing an opponent an opening to strike out the Grey Knight. It lowered its warrior's grip, just a hint, to allow an enemy strike to weave its way through its defenses. But each and every time, Crow would simply grunt and compensate. That wasn't going to work either. The blade saw an opportunity to maybe try and work away at one of Crow's brethren's defences. After all, now that he had to carry the blade everywhere, there had to be an opportunity. And there were. There were opportunities to begin clawing away at others' mental defences. But the moment Crow noticed this, he simply just sequestered himself in his private quarters for all the time. Still holding the blade gripped tightly in his hands. And so it continued. Even in those occasions when the blade was actually genuinely offering to help because its agenda aligned with crowds, such as, for example, when the Grey Knights were dispatched to defeat one of the most powerful demons in existence, the Herald of Corn, Skulltaker. Antwer hated this entity in a way that only an immortal shard of a god, mayhaps, could possibly hate anything. It pleaded with Crow. It would help him. It would strike the demon down. It would lend him all its power. It would ask for nothing in return but for the pleasure of biting into the skull taker's flesh and ripping its soul to shreds. I'm sure by now you can anticipate Crow's response. A grunt and a two-handed swing as he continued simply just battering the herald of corn with an inert hunk of dead metal again and again like a baseball bat wielded by a back alley thug thump 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 for hours and hours and hours the weapon not being a power weapon, seeing as Antwer was not allowed to do anything, it was simple, just a, a hunk of metal. A hunk of incredibly durable metal. A hunk of unbreakable metal, to be sure, but in the end, nothing more than a solid stick. Not even particularly sharp. Particularly not against the iron-hard skin of the Herald of Corn. Crow could not injure the demon, not in the slightest. He could simply continue to hit him again and again. This went on for so long that the Herald began to run out of warp energies as Crow's brethren set about destroying the Skulltaker's army, destroying them and severing their connections, in turn severing the warp's connections. The duel between Crow and the Skulltaker went on for so long they even finished closing the warp rift which allowed Korn's champion to invade the real world in the first place. And so, 
screaming in the sort of frustration that Antwerp must have deeply sympathized with, even with his enemy at this point. The Herald of Corn was banished back to the warp with several dents all across his body. Turning, still in silence, still with both hands locked securely around his sword, Crow made his way back to a small chamber aboard his brotherhood's ship, where he continued to ignore the incessant screaming of the sword. As for Antwerp, his suffering continues to this day. You know, I almost feel bad for it. Imagine you are the remnants of a god, a being of immeasurable intellect, a creature that, simp that does not simply live, it only exists. It knows not death, it knows not truly even life. It only knows its instincts, its wants, and its agenda. It has seen civilizations rise and fall. To it, every creature it has come across has been nothing more than a slave waiting to be shackled. And now, this fragment of a being beyond human comprehension is clasped tight, unescaping, in the hands of what can only be presumed to be a power armor clad ogrim. <laughs> that is the kind of despair that only an entity that cannot die could possibly ever feel. <laughs> oh well, I am sure it deserved it. Or at least I hope so, as frankly, I don't even think the four chaos powers have invented torture quite so devilish. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.